Professor of History and Literary Arts at the National Hispanic Cultural Center. <laughs> The NHCC is dedicated to the preservation, promotion, and advancement of Hispanic Latinx culture, arts, and humanities. And we're a division of the State of New Mexico Department of Cultural Affairs. I would like to acknowledge that New Mexico is comprised of the ancestral and unceded land of 19 sovereign Pueblo nations, as well as three Apache tribes and the Navajo nation, Diné. We are indebted to the original owners and caretakers of this land and to the land itself. We are also dedicated to engagement with complex issues of history, culture, and heritage. This kind of engagement is at the heart of cultural understanding and promotes, we believe, a legacy that is dedicated to justice and reconciliation. I'm joined tonight by staff members in the History and Literary Arts program, Anna Uremovich, who takes care of all the logistics for this series, and Cassandra Osterlo, our NHCC Zoom tech and NHCC librarian, and I think I see Patricia Perea, who's our HLA educator. I'm so grateful for them for enabling this programming to happen. We're very excited to launch this series, Perspectivas Modernas Latin America, in collaboration with the University of New Mexico Department of History, Center for the Southwest and Latin American and Iberian Institute. Liz Hutchison and I started cooking up the idea for a Latin American series last fall, and her colleagues and mine have been very generous in joining in. From our perspective at the NHCC, we wanted to expand our history and literary arts programming even more deeply into countries outside the US with a focus not only on history, but on relevant and important contemporary issues. For these reasons, we're very excited to continue the series this month with Francisco Galarte on trans-American detritus, a study in transfemicide. This late winter and spring, these talks happen every uh, Tuesday, every second Tuesday of the month through May, and we hope you'll join us each time. Now I'd like to introduce Francis Hayashida, Professor of Archaeology and Anthropology and Director of the Latin American and Iberian Institute at UNM. Then we'll take a care of a few housekeeping details, introduce our speaker for tonight, and he will take it from there. Thanks again for joining us. Francis? Thank you, Valerie. Good evening, everyone. On behalf of UNM's Latin American and Iberian Institute, the Department of History and the Center for the Southwest, Welcome to tonight's talk. We're delighted to be here to help share exciting new scholarship on Latin America by UNM faculty. It's a great privilege for us to partner with the National Hispanic Cultural Center and to spend time with all of you this evening. So thank you. I'll now pass the Zoom mic over to Anna uh, Uremovich from the NHCC. Thank you, Francis. Hello, everyone. I am going to take you through a few housekeeping uh, procedures. So first of all, our speaker will present for about 30 to 45 minutes, followed by a 15 minute question and answer session. During the presentation, all of you will be muted. So there's no background noise or interruptions. After the talk, we will open the chat box for questions and comments. We will field the questions and present them to our speaker. Right now, you may want to grab a pen and paper and write down questions that pop up during the presentation so you can type them in the chat box later. At the end of the session, we will share details about next month's talk and also provide a link in the chat box that allows you to take a quick one minute feedback survey. The survey tells us about your experience with this event and enables us to be responsive to your needs. Thank you in advance for this. And now I'd like to introduce Sam Truitt, Director of the Center for the Southwest at the University of New Mexico, who will introduce our speaker. Thank you, Anna. Um, it is my great pleasure uh, tonight to introduce our speaker, Francisco J. Galarte, who is an Assistant Professor of American Studies and Women, Gender and Sexuality Studies and director of the Feminist Research Institute at University of New Mexico. He was born and raised in Brawley, California, just north of Mexicali in Calexico on the US-Mexico border and identifies as transfronterizo. He received his PhD in educational policy studies from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign 
And in his research and teaching, he brings transgender studies, Chickenex studies, Latinx studies, and queer studies into critical dialogue. He is the author of Brown Transfigurations, Rethinking Race, Gender, and Sexuality in Chicanx and Latinx Studies, which came out earlier this year with the University of Texas Press. And his work has also appeared in such venues as Aztlan, Journal of Chicano Studies, Chicana Latina Studies Journal, and TSQ, Transgender Studies Quarterly. He has been involved with TSQ, Transgender Studies Quarterly, since the journal's inception in 2011, and served as the fashion editor from 2012 to, to, through 2018, and since then has served as general co-editor of the journal. The title of Galarte's talk today is Trans-American Detritus, a Study in Transfemicide. Please welcome Francisco Galarte. Thank you so much uh, for a wonderful introduction, uh, Sam, and, and thank you everyone else um, for being here, all the organizers. I'm deeply appreciative to have been invited. I'm new to UNM, and so it's uh, been very delaying to get to know everybody um, so quickly and uh, for uh, the opportunity for me to be able to, to share my work. And, and so again, thank you to the NHCC. Department of History, all of my wonderful colleagues. I appreciate you and I appreciate everyone who's who's here today. Um, so I, I decided to present on new work. My book just came out and, and so um, I was talking to folks and they were like, well, why don't you just read from your book? Um, and I felt like I wanted to push myself to write something new. So this is very, very, literally very new. New was in the last, you know, couple of weeks and kind of preparing and reading. And this is the continuation of a project that I've been thinking about um, after I finished my book, um, which is about uh, trans feminicide and kind of re-understanding uh, the border and border politics in this current moment where, um, you know, new materialisms is something that's on my mind. Um, also looking at how uh, trans sex workers have been documented over time, especially in Juarez as kind of a site or an incubator site um, for understanding transmission around HIV and AIDS, and also kind of politics and just really understanding how this particular population and trans women um, are excluded and not purposefully, I don't think all the time, but aren't even really thought of or figured as uh, being counted within the context of trans feminicide um, in Juarez and that organizing. So I don't even think that they're imagined to be a part of that. And I'm not saying that that's a bad thing necessarily, um, but I want to draw attention to how drawing in a trans analytic might kind of reframe our understanding of what um, uh, thing, how things are in the border and how they shift over time and how a particular population of trans uh, sex workers in Juarez persist, right? I'm not saying that the same group of women persist over time and have long, have a long, have a long life. They don't experience longevity, but there's always a market for trans sex work, right? This is kind of a labor industry that has a demand will continue to have a demand even when they're displaced. Um, and so the talk today, I think rather than a study of feminicide, which I wanted to do, it's more of a talk on um, uh, kind of the process of dispossession and how that's figured within photography and, and, and a little bit around the ethics about what it might mean to write about trans photography, trans subjects, um, and also to read photos that figure trans subjects. So in a way that the subjects don't become these figurations that stand in to bear the brunt of the critique, to stand in to be the metaphors of the point and the politics uh, of what we're trying to view as scholars and academics who are wanting to talk about larger systems uh, related to disposition, dispossession and violence um, and things like you know narco violence in a place that's so fraught uh, like what is, um, but to you know, really kind of bring some, some important observations around these subjectivities and how they persisted over time in and through a process of uh, destruction and degradation. Uh, and what I'm kind of gonna be talking about today specifically is detritus. It's an idea I'm trying to work through. So um, I'm gonna go ahead and begin. So, in this lecture, it is my intention to make a series of provisional observations about selected works 
by Mexican artist Teresa Margoles' 2016 solo exhibition entitled Pista del Baile, or Dance Floor, in which uh, premiered or um, opened in Zurich, Switzerland in 2016. Between 20, 2006 and 2016, Margoles focused her artistic practice on Ciudad Juarez, Mexico. Installed at the Peter Kiltman Gallery, the work consists of a series of photographs and three large sculptures made of architectural remnants taken from Ciudad Juarez. The work featured in the show with whom the artists worked closely, photographed, and documented their narratives. The work documents the most recent and successful attempt by Ciudad Juarez to regenerate um, and restore the historic city center or Centro Histórico, where the photos of these women were taken. Margolis's work highlights the destruction and cleansing of the downtown by centering the displacement of sex workers and low-income residents from the city center. Since the 1990s, Ciudad Juarez has been most associated with state-sponsored impunity and complicity with various forms of violence that are interconnected. <clears throat> yeah, I lost my face. It's easy to do it on the word document. Okay. That are interconnected. Femicide and medical drug-related violence. According to the gallery's press release, the work in this exhibition focuses on, quote, sensations felt by objects, end quote, and, quote, buildings or spaces uh, that are not just ruins or crime scenes, but rather they structure and condition incidents and events, end quote. Margolis's usual artistic practice most often incorporates physical remnants of violent crimes resulting from political corruption and social exclusion. Typically, she uses post-mortem matter such as blood, stained sheets, or use of nickel thread to make the life of the corpse visible in public space. The photographic work in this exhibition, however, also focuses on the sensations felt by actual living subjects, the trans, sub the trans, trans sex workers. This talk examines Margolis' exhibit to propose an alternative frame for engagement with feminicide specifically one that grapples with the embodied complexities of trans subjectivity and embodiment as it transits with globalization along the U.S.-Mexico border. So am I, am I a little bit muffled or can everybody hear okay? Yeah, you're yeah, a little, you're bit, a little muffled. bit muffled. Ooh, that was loud, sorry. <laughs> uh, there's, no there's no audio there. I'm going to get off the headphones and just put okay. my... Yeah, it started off clear, but then it, when you started the actual more in the in depth in the presentation, then it got muffled. Okay, is this a little bit better? Yeah, that's better. Okay, perfect. So this talk examines Margolis' exhibit to propose an alternative frame for engagement with feminicide, specifically one that grapples with the embodied complexities of trans subjectivity and embodiment as it transits with globalization along the US-Mexico border. Margolis' work forces the viewer to encounter necro-subjection, which Gilberto Rosas defines as representing those who are made uh, and who make themselves dead in order to live. Pista del Baile illustrates the materiality of the violence, displacement, destruction, and death that has ravaged Ciudad Juarez, and also the affective contours of loss, future loss, and surprisingly, vitalism. When encountering the scenes of destruction and detritus in the photographs and the remnants of a past history salvaged through the use of architectural re remains as sculpture, what's a sculpture and as part of a landscape in photography, what sort of affects can we excavate from these works? And furthermore, what kind of insight does it provide for understanding the vicissitudes of transgender subjectivity? Before delving into a reading of selected works from Pista del Baile, I will provide an overview of the social political context during which Margolis was producing this body of work. <clears throat> 
I will then think through the relation between the categories of trans and detritus as they are represented within selected photos. And, and I was going to talk about the sculptures, but I, I don't think that we'll have time for that today. So I'm just going to focus on the photos um, from the exhibit. And finally, if time permits, I will conclude with an engagement with the place of loss within trans feminisms. So part one uh, is entitled, in quotes, the violence is over. In, 20, in 2006, Mexican President Felipe Calderón declared his war against organized crime, sending in federal police to oversee Juarez's security. Thrusting Juarez into a, a period in its history where between 2008 and 2012, the city lost 20% of its population, employment rates top 20%, extortions and kidnapping, and kidnapping contributed to the closing of thousands of local businesses and the abandonment of more than 25% uh, of spaces within the Centro Historico. Well, the homicide rate, rate for young men jumped 40%. I'm sorry, 400%. <clears throat> By 2012, the Mexican federal government had issued a warning to Mexican journalists to stop using words such as assassination, torture, hitmen, decapitation, and other related terms that index the violence that journalists had been documenting since 2006. At this time, and with the entrance of a new president, it was declared that the war was over. Juarez's Centro Historico was the hub of violence and suffered the most carnage and economic devastation following the 2006 drug war. And in the wake of the end of the war, Juarez city officials move forward to pursue a fresh start for the city center. According to Melissa Wright, local business and political leaders teamed up with global investors to embark on the city's most ambitious gentrification plan in the city's history. The mayor behind the plan, Hector Murguia, also referred to as Teto, declared it, quote, the rescue of Ciudad Juarez. The motivation be behind the urban renewal project was to renovate and repopulate the city center. At the center of the plan was to destruct the human, the historic structures in the centro and replace them with high-end condos, boutiques, and restaurants. The Centro Historico in Juarez was home to many of the city's historic nightclubs and bars that date back to prohibition. Of those historic bars and clubs, only the Kentucky Club remains. And of course, the bar made famous why Juan Gabriel El Noa Noa, uh, which uh, burned down in 2008 and now is a parking lot. Within the Centro Historico is La Mariscal, one of the city's many red light districts. Uh, and since there isn't a formal Zona Rosa in um, Ciudad Juarez, is just a side note. Um, that's what makes Juarez so unique in the sense because there isn't a formal Zona Rosa it makes it very hard for Mexican officials to really kind of oversee the way in which, you know, uh, sex work is um, managed in other parts of uh, Mexico. So um, because there is no formal Zona Rosa, sex work happens in various forms and iterations throughout the city, whether it's in brothel, brothels, uh, whether it was in the 90s, early 2000s, it happened a lot in bars, or at least that's where the transactions were made. And then, of course, we have sex work that happens like on the street, which is uh, presumably the most, the least safe of different ways to, to encounter, different ways in which sex workers kind of undertake transactions. <clears throat> so uh, within the Centro Historico is La Mariscal, one of the city's red light districts, and it was the first target of the development project started that started in 2008. Investors bought properties through voluntary exchanges or through eminent, eminent domain enforcement. And many of these buildings were demolished, but the global ep economic crisis of 2008 and 2009 halted the project and dozens of buildings lay in ruins. And by 2010, a Juarez-based reporter described La Mariscal as looking bom bombed out. Between 2006 and 2011, Juarez was often described as a war zone, with the working poor of the city bearing the brunt of Calderón's war. The decline in the ability of the working poor to, to both spend money in the Centro Historico, paired with the sharp decline in US tourism, La Mariscal and the Centro Historico also began its slow death. La Mariscal has traditionally been the zone in Juarez where sex workers did business, primarily in the bars and in proximity, to La Mariscal and the Centro Histórico. 
Unlike previous attempts to clear sex workers this, by the city, um, which were met with pushback by bar owners who advocated on behalf of the, of the value of sex work to the tourist industry and resisted selling to outside investors, 2011 marked a new era in Juarez policing that paired with the literal destruction of the places of work of these sex workers, an entire labor force of sex workers was effectively displaced and thrust into perilous living and working conditions. Melissa Wright has written extensively on the struggles of sex workers in Juarez. During the decade of the 1990s, she documented efforts to collectively organize against uh, the city's desire to remove them from the Centro Historico as part of a redevelopment and cleansing plan. And she also documents other women-led activism in response to the city of Juarez's characterization of women and girls in public space as evidence of trouble, and thus responsible for the hundreds of women who were and continue to be kidnapped and brutally murdered in Juarez. Wright explains that feminist-led activist coalitions attack the discourse of female trouble by declaring that the women on Ciudad Juarez's streets were hijas, the working daughters and the mothers of the Juarense families who fueled the city's globalized economy, specifically meaning those who were employed by the maquilas. The sex worker collectives studied by Wright employed similar arguments by asserting that they were sex workers, but also mothers that needed to work to feed their children. It becomes important to interject uh, that, this, that seemingly the trans sex workers are not figured within either of these categories uh, that are being pinned down in relationship to womanhood, such as mother or daughter. Therefore, in this sense, from the 1990s to the early 2010s, trans sex workers are the unthought uncategor and uncategorizable uh, within activisms and organizing around issues of feminicide or feminicidio. It is not until Sayeg Valencia's theorizations of transfeminism and core capitalism that trans sex workers are imagined within feminist praxis and world building. Unfortunately, the circumstances in the late 1990s were marked markedly different to the realities of Juarez in 2011. The urban renewal project that decimated La Mariscal was made possible through the hiring of police chief Le Lesaola who upon arrival to Juarez announced a plan to secure the city through an intensification of police foot patrols and with a broken windows approach influenced and borrowed by Giuliano from Giuliani's cleanup of Times Square in New York City. The first area on his agenda was to clean up the Centro Historico. Poor youth, specifically young men, were targeted as part of a coordinated effort to combat sex trafficking. This resulted and this is, you know, combat sex trafficking in quotes, because uh, more, I mean, really, he was just trying to remove sex workers um, from the bars and, and brothels in the area. This resulted in the raids of brothels, restaurants, and cantinas in the Centro Historico, and in, in, in an era of, of police brutaliz brutalization of the Centro Historico's youth. Next on Chief Lezaola's list was to target informal vendors in the Centro and these vendors uh, were where the city's working poor uh, would go and, and find used clothes, electronics, and other goods. Uh, these vendors were characterized by Le Saola as fronts for organized crime and general delinquency. The policing and land grabbing tactics used by the city of Juarez effectively disemployed the city's working poor, effectively removing both these, po both these employed in the Centro and those who relied on the used goods and markets in the area to buy goods at low costs. Soon after the demolitions resumed and effectively, according to Wright, Juarez was not a dying city, but rather a murdered one. At this point, I, can, I want to move on to the dead subject that is featured most prominently in Margolis' Pista del Baile, La Mariscal de Juarez. So, at the beginning of this talk, I mentioned that the subjects of the photos are actual, you know, trans women. Uh, at this point, I'd ask us to consider, uh, to ask the question in Pista de Baile, uh, who is the subject of these photographs? So I'm gonna go ahead and put them up for you while I'm talking. Uh, 
here to quite a few photos in the series. Um, so I want to draw attention to the landscapes at this point. And this section is called Pista de Baile, Trans and Detritus. So to begin examining the photo series in Pista de Baile, I find it imperative to ask who is the subject of these photographs? Are the subjects the trans sex workers whose gazes meet or do not meet ours as we look at them? Or is the subject of the photograph the detritus, the ruins that comprise the landscapes of the photographs? There are multiple definitions of the word detritus of interest are the following. One, an accumulation of debris of any sort. Two, waste or, dis or disintegrated material of any kind or debris. Three, matter produced by detrition or wearing away of exposed surfaces. And finally, four, wearing away or down by detrition, disintegration, decomposition. So first I want to conceptually explore the, I want to explore detritus to better account for how we can think of the demolished buildings, piles of dirt and gravel and trash that we encounter in the landscapes of these photos. If we think of detritus as a process of wearing down, specifically decomposition, then perhaps it becomes important to think of detritus as la maris to think of la mariscal as detritus, and specifically the ruins of the bars that are the detritus in the photos as engaged in a process of decomposition. And so I don't think I mentioned this at the beginning, but the sites where these women are posed are at the sites of um, where bars were, right? So it's like the ruins. Um, the torn down bars is, is, is where these women are, are posed and staged uh, by Margolis. So specifically the ruins of the bars that are the detritus in the photos as engaged, the detritus is engaged in a process of decomposition. So in many ways we're witnessing the process of death in these bars, the process of the death of these bars or a process of dying. The pictures of Margolis that Mar Margolis takes slows down the quick pace of displacement and dispossession described by the events leading to the raising of the Centro Historico as part of a process of gentrification. These scenes of ruin are figures in and of themselves as the women are subjects in the photographs. On the one hand, the ruins stand in for enigmatic visual metonyms for what, what has now vanished and what Lisa Lowe understands as, quote, the metaphoricity of globalization, which she defines as, quote, rhetorical proliferation of figures that attend to the desire to render what is not yet fathomed as objectively known, end quote. In rehearsing the numbers associated with quantifying violence through body counts and employment rates, arrests uh, that, that essentially lead to the destruction of La Mariscal and the, displace, and the displacements of his denizens, the ruins are a figure that, quote, thematize, thematizes the aesthetic and epistemological predicaments of globalization itself, in which a ruins vanishing materiality alludes to the violent loss and deterritorialization that are the conditions for the desire to reflect, to reflect, mourn, and remember. And that is also uh, from Lisa Lowe. On the one hand, the scenes of the ruins are allegories that signify more than a specific loss or an individual destruction. They allude to an excess beyond their manifest or surface content with a finite order or meaning. And on the other register, and on the other, they register the erosion of time. And when paired with the trans subjects in the photos, this radically shifts our senses of normative embodiment of both the landscapes and the figures that traverse it. The misery, extraction, and destruction of dispossession and violence are connoted or metaphorized in the ruins and not through the bodies of the trans subjects in the photos. Rather, rather than reading the ruins as an inanimate object, and I understand, I understand the photograph as capturing the process of a slow vanishing of materiality. This enables an analysis to consider how transness specifically transition or change uh, interfaces with space and process of processes of mattering. Lisa Lowe's discussion of Walter Benjamin is instructive here, especially as I examine the photos and attempt to answer the question of precisely of what do these snapshots do? According to Lisa Lowe, 
Benjamin notes that ruins are, quote, allegories of this dialectic of modernity, inaugurating a process, a sensibility, and a reflection on such ambivalence against a symbol that affirms a contained totality of truth, beauty, and morality. Benjamin posed allegory, which alludes to meaning beyond itself and reckons dialectically and open-endedly with the barbarism of civilization. Allegories are in the realm of thoughts, but ruins are in the realms of things. Allegories lead the reader and viewer to an excess, to the world-making possibilities beyond or outside the relations of the work or object itself. Allegory reckons with and defies the violence of the historical and generic conventions that insist on a single universal order of being in the world. So in Lisa Yonayama's work on the ruins of Hiroshima, she notes that, quote, reckoning with ruins is, quote, a space of criticism, a resurrected site of storytelling where one begins to ask how the original loss was produced, if in fact the loss was inevitable, and what is at stake in remembering and forgetting the past. So as I transition to showing you and working through a reading, a provisional reading, I'll note, of the photographs, I want you to hold on to Yonayama's phrase, resurrected site of storytelling, as I will recall this imagery of resurrection in a few moments. I began this talk by introducing the term coined by Gilberto Rosas, uh, and that term is necrosubjection. He understands this process of necrosubjection to speak to the emergence of the living dead, or quote, those who can never rest. And he notes that this is represented in representations of zombies. It can be easy to see how sex work in a city enthralled by ongoing spectacular terror can render sex workers as subjects uh, from, which sub which, from which society must be defended against. Wright details in her work precisely how the city of Juarez tried to remove sex workers from the centro. I'm not wholly convinced, however, that the transgender sex workers figured here in the photos that I'm talking about today, even figure into the imagination as a cohesive subjectivity in this context of terror created by the nexus of feminicide, narco violence, and extractive economies. And by the same token, I'm not sure that zombie is an apt figuration to capture the stances and gazes of, women, of the women photographed by Margolis in what Rosas describes as an as, as in how Rosas describes Juarez as an increasingly dystopic reality. In these photos, we are left to imagine what it is only these women who have survived an apocalypse. Imagine that it is only, so in these photos, we are left to imagine that it is only these women who have survived an apocalypse. And they therefore must rely, we must rely on them to reproduce social relations in this post-war, and I might even suggest uh, trans, Juarez, this trans city we might call Juarez. I'm not inferring that these women will not encounter danger or die. In fact, the creation of the new centro did displace these women and significantly contributed to their deaths. In fact, after the, the show premiered, uh, one of the women that was photographed was almost immediately killed. And since then, a majority of the women who are represented in the photos have, have died. Um, what I'm specifically asking us to lean into is a suggestion that there is a way these photos might ask us to look towards these subjects that are always already forgotten, always already dead, or on their way to death to teach us about loss, refusal, and most importantly, vitalism. These subjects from generation to generation of sex workers uh, to the trans migrants living in Juarez currently, living in Juarez now who are currently awaiting their asylum hearings these women know how to reckon and navigate the orders of violence that are intractable, normative, and normalized. They already engage the world in a way that Rosas describes as constituting the promise of necrosubjectivities. Rosas notes that necrosubjection, quote, pushes at potentialities between long, beyond long-standing binaries of resistance and accommodation, and which may or may not ultimately infiltrate larger larger assemblages of culture and politics, those oppositional forces, affects, and practices found outside traditional notions of politics. So I'm going to go ahead and go through uh, 
go through the photograph. So first we have um, Scarlett who is photographed where the um, club La Cruda used to be. Uh, and then on the other side, we have Sansara who is photographed where Irma's used to be. And I, I wanna note that Irma's is a club that I've had, is a club or a nightclub that has been a long standing place for trans sex workers um, to do business and to work at and was a source of home. And this is what I found in my research from the 1990s um, by looking at ethnog ethnographies uh, specifically of um, Carol Sullivan, whose papers are here at UNM. Uh, Sullivan visited Irma's quite frequently and um, talked uh, with the woman and did research there with the woman at Irma's. So um, that Irma's was still, still existed in 2016 is a, a testament to uh, its place um, in relationship to trans sex work. <clears throat> and so I'll go back to Sansara because I'll talk about that photo, but I also wanted to show you uh, Osiris and Jacqueline. So um, the pictures that I picked all had women in these poses that I felt were almost the anti-zombie pose, right? There is a vitalism within them, um, the gestures they pose themselves. Um, Margolis uh, worked with them very closely, gathered their narratives, um, and they styled themselves, posed themselves, and the only thing that Margolis uh, changed about the settings is that she poured water um, over um, the place where the dance floors would have been uh, when the clubs or the buildings were still um, uh, standing and, and not, and for, before they had been demolished, in other words. <clears throat> so let's think and look at Sansara for a little bit. So when I look at Sansara, I, I, I see that Sansara shows us vitality. She shows us vitalism. Instead of the death, um, we see a, a life. We see a very kind of strong monumental figure. In this figure, if we note her pose, uh, Sansara stands where Marga, Margoles has marked where the dance floors or the pistas uh, once were with water. We might understand this marking. This is something that I'm thinking through as a catafalque, that is the French word that I'm still learning how to, how to pronounce. I might have pronounced it wrong. Um, but Derrida engages this concept in his uh, experimental autobiography, uh, where he's talking about remains. Um, and so this catafalque is uh, understood or defined as a platform raised as an honor in the middle of a church to receive the coffin or effigy of the deceased. So what if we understand Sansara to be uh, standing on this platform of honor that Margolis has created with her through the use of water, which water itself, when I think of water, I think of life, I think of vitality, of vitalism. Um, and so if we think of this, uh, the dead or the dying here behind Sansara, so the remnants, the remains, are still in process, the decomposition, the process of dying continues, but Sansara's pose gestures to the interaction between her transvitalism evidenced in the pose, in the style, uh, in her body, um, and her persistence, uh, her continued persistence to live, right, for life in a dying, crumbling world that surrounds her. This illuminates that through violence, the straining and making precarious of life, vitalism emerges and lingers even after the official ontological closure of life itself. And in that phrase that I'm borrowing from Munoz here, after the official ontological closure of life itself, I'm suggesting that we might think about, you know, at the point in which the remains are built over, right? Um, that vitalism might continue among trans sex workers, even though that Santara might die. But we know about this particular population that even in the context in which they are made to, they, they are made dead, right? Made to live in death. Uh, that they continue to navigate the surroundings and uh, make lives for themselves. What social life is and could be for this. So Sansara shows us a little bit or the possibilities that she gestures towards, uh, shows us what social life is and could be for dispossessed people. The ruins of the nightclub reveal a real time dispossession of the area as a kind of collateral damage to anarcho violence and economies. But at the same time, I think that Margolis's portraits reveal the life that these trans sex workers have been living and the realities. They stage their life and traces in prefectual ways. 
uh, through and in relationship to overlapping precarities and multiple forms of dispossession that even predate this larger kind of citywide process of dispossessing and removing sex workers from the city center. So Sansara's pose figures the female body as monumental and elemental in visceral, beautiful ways. The figures of the photos, much like the detritus of the buildings, will inevitably crumble and be erased, but yet we're left with a trace as left with us through Margolis's figures, uh, photos. And so now I want to, for a minute, uh, move to Berenice, which is a photo that I, I find um, probably the most interesting just because of the play of the colors um, that make me think of the trans uh, pride flag in the pink and the white, and that's gray, but we can, uh, it still makes me think of the, the pale blue in that particular flag. And if, I don't know if you can see from your screens, it says Salida on the wall, which is an exit, right? So through her pose, uh, she looks toward the ex exit with a certain kind of unknowability in her gaze. She looks away in the direction at the same time. We don't necessarily know what she's looking towards. We don't necessarily know what she shares with us or wants to communicate with us, but we might understand this as a particular kind of exit. So one of the questions that interests me in this photo, and I think that is captured in this photo, is the notion of the unshareable, which is a notion that Jose Esteban Munoz works through um, in his most recent book um, on brownness um, and his, and his um, engagement with Jean-Luc Nancy. So, the unshareable is the ineffable. It's the trauma, the wound. How do we account for how the women experience material effects of violence that are not solely attributed to the displacement and destruction that forms the backgrounds of these photos? The affective experiences of violences of the femicide machine that frame the conditions for women who live in Juarez uh, are in many ways unshareable. Vitalism embodied through uh, Berenice's stance as she stands on the water, or if we think of Santara's stance as well. Um, the stances give us a snapshot of the unshareable. Uh, there's a trace of something that we just can't quite grasp. And I think that's important. Uh, and Jose Osteban Munoz reminds us that according to Jean-Luc Nancy, the unshareable is that thing that is shared out as the incalculable, the inoperative, the invaluable. Nancy explains that, quote, we know these things as art, as friendship, love, thought, knowledge, or emotion, end quote. So if we are to differentiate between these various singularities that come together or culminate and result in the dispossession and destruction, dispossession of uh, the denizens or the, those who live and work and, and move to the Centro Historico, um, and then also the people who must flee their homes, the disappearance and the murders of cis women, um, if we think of all of these singularities, right, we can understand um, the, they call, they, uh, they in some ways culminate or come together to form a kind of plurality. Um, and this is what I understand Jose Esteban Munoz to be interested in, kind of the singular plurals of being in, being in relation. And this is what I'm trying to think through these photos as. Um, so if we want to will these singularities, right, of, you know, murder, of destruction, of dispossession, to flow together into a common condition that is marked life in Juarez, perhaps they also, but we also want to maintain the freedom and the difference, differences of these singularities. The exhibition or the photos offers us a sense of the world that these women inhabit, or the mundos, um, which is evident in one of the sculptures that uh, we won't have time to talk about today, but it's a actual sign that says mundos that Margolis uh, salvaged from one of the um, demolitions of the of the bars and is exhibited in the show and it makes a lot of noise, the lights are on and so it stands in to give us kind of this oral effect of um, this oral effect of like what um, destruction, dispossession and these processes might sound like. Um, so in this kind of buzzing in this kind of um, being disoriented uh, we experience a swarm of singularities, and these swarm singularities are marked by urgencies and intensities. I'm inspired by Munoz's discussion of the work of Ana Mendieta here, which is where I'm, I'm getting all these notions of singular, plural, and relationality. 
Um, and he describes this described Mendieta's work as presenting a sense of the world as brown. However, I have not reached the conclusion as to whether brown as a concept can adequately approximate the depth and field of the urgencies and intensities that Margolis's work intends to represent. Are the women in the photos enveloped by the detritus or mastering it or neither? So here are some cautionary tales that I, I want to end with as I pivot towards trans feminism in relationship to talking about or reading trans photography. Um, so one of the things that I wanted to do in my book that I wanted to do here that I started in my book is I, I don't want these figures to stand in and to bear the brunt as a larger metaphor, which is why I kind of talk about the landscapes and how they interface. So thinking about the landscape and the detritus as a subject and the living thing and interfacing with these women who are subjects really kind of pivot me towards being able to avoid some of the, the pitfalls around um, talking about representations of, of trans people. So Jay Prosser notes that in relationship to trans photography, photographs don't record reality, they change the very nature of reality by representing it. So for a trans person to become an object in a photo um, is to make one suffer almost as much as a surgical operation. What's painful about photography and gender reassignment surgery both is that in spite, in spite of those, in spite of those who, in spite of how close, I'm sorry, they come to reproducing the real, to making contact with the real, they ultimately, they ultimately fail, right? So Prosser is saying something both about transition and gender reassignment surgery and attempting to capture uh, trans subjects. There's a failure there. There's always a trace of transsexuality. And so why we read these trans subjects different, why I read these trans subjects differently is I wanted to focus on the coexistence of loss and life and vitalism, which is ultimately what we see in Margolis's photos. If we return to the photos and focus in on that loss, I understand loss to be inseparable, inseparable from what remains, for what is lost is known only by what remains of it, by how these remains are produced, read, and sustained. The remains of life for Margolis are viscerally literal, objects, substances, material traces that remind us that there are indeed remains of life, and that these remains not only haunt, but physically attach themselves to us in ways that go beyond the typical, typical functions of memory. So to kind of conclude with memory and the future of transfeminism and the outcome of this larger kind of pulse that drives the photos to begin with, which is the displacement and the renovation of Centro Historico, um, where this talk will pivot or this article, what it, what it ends up being is, you know, what ends up being built over La Mariscal is the uh, a, a plaza dedicated to Juan Gabriel, um, who is, you know, a, a famous singer in Mexico who has much value to people who are queer in Mexico, even though Juan Gabriel himself was not living in the world where he announced himself as gay, he, he figures in kind of that homo national kind of figure that we can equate uh, with gentrification, right? The entrance or the ascendance of a upper class um, LGBT subject, even though I think I understand more working class people to kind of be attached to Juan Gabriel, but certainly, you know, US Latinos who live in the US who are queer, who are not always working class have a certain attachment to Juan Gabriel. So it's a, it's a, it's a, the trans feminist critique of that I haven't gone to that's like unfinished for me, but it's something that I want to think about of what it might mean for, you know, a plaza dedicated to Juan Gabriel to be built over um, a place where trans sex workers were effectively removed from um, and moved, made more marginal within a city and more susceptible to death. Um, and we have this superstar um, who means so much symbolically for LGBT persons, uh, musically as a figure, as an, as, 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 as a, as an icon, um, but who also is interfacing with a large scale upheaval of, you know, the working poor within Juarez and presumably um, the most marginal and working class uh, subjects in um, Juarez. So I wanted to talk a little bit more about uh, the now of trans politics in, in Juarez, um, but those thoughts are still a little provisional for me to kind of make some conclusive efforts. But I know that a big part of it is reckoning, reckoning with the loss. And then also, you know, the part, the, the next part is 
you're really kind of excavating, not excavating, but exploring, you know, the politics of the building of a site like the Juan Gabriel Plaza over a space and a place like La Mariscal, uh, which is so meaningful and is a safe, has been a safety haven for trans sex workers um, since, since the early 1990s and even presumably before that. Um, so thank you all so much uh, for, uh, for this. And I hope we have some questions. As I mentioned, this is brand new work for me. It's a new project. So I, I'm here and excited to think through ideas and, and questions with you all. So, I can, um, you know, move this work along. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, Francisco. That was that was amazing and um, just so interesting. So yeah, look at us applauding you. You can't hear us, um, but we will um, open the chat now for questions. And I'm going to click on that. Um, there's just so many um, for me phrases in there that um, I probably need some help unpacking. So while we people are filling the chat box, I'll ask you maybe um, to, to talk a little bit more about one for me. And that is um, this idea of resurrection. And I know you use the phrase resurrected sites of recognition, but I'm just wondering if you could talk a little bit more about that concept of resurrection. Do you mean that in the sense not of the same places coming up again, but it strikes me that the water beneath the women in some ways, that's another thing that they, it signals the dance floors, right? In some ways, but it's also talk about vital, you know, mm -hmm. they look like they're, they're emerging from the water or the water emerges from them, but that may not be what you had in mind. I mean, I definitely think it, I think that the, the water is a, it's a vitalism and it opens up and it marks a sacred space, I think. So I think there's also that religi religiosity around like what dance clubs or nightclubs like represent to trans subjects and queer subjects that that kind of indexes in a particular way that is significant um, in a landscape that I've marked as in the process of dying or death, right? So I, I'm, I'm thinking about what, what the possibilities of a tr these trans subjects being like upheld here on this platform, not like Jesus like, you know, literally, but, you know, in this, in, in being the, the, uh, the icons, right, of what these spaces, what the memory of these spaces might be. So it's kind of re re resurrecting or, um, you know, you know, resurrecting their images and, and not reading them in the way that they're used to being read, which is kind of these figures of kind of like postmodern gender flexibility, you know, curiosity, but rather kind of the the those who emerge from these rubble right who or who or didn't even you know weren't even buried in the rubble but you know make their way back to these sites in different types of ways if, if that i mean that's what i'm kind of trying to, to think to think through yeah fascinating thank you so thank we you. have in the chat a request to look at some of the sculpture images but before yeah. you go there there is a question um I love what you have to say about loss being inseparable from remains and pointing toward a view of renovation, but to what extent would renovation constitute a new kind of loss? And Sam's asking that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I think that the loss, I think that the loss, it's, it's not, I, I guess I, I don't want to say that the loss itself gets resolved because I, I think that loss is part of what constitutes uh, this kind of trans subjectivity that I'm gesturing at. Um, so I think I'm trying to understand the loss of a space um, and then the loss that these women are also themselves, how they are coming to subjection, right? So the loss of like never being able to attain the real of, you know, wanting to have sexual retirement surgery, right? To access the real womanhood, right? Like that particular loss, I think, instantiates them in their sociality and their relations and their condition. And I also understand like being, when I think of trans sex workers on the border, I mean, the early narratives that I've read and examined from the 1990s, you know, a lot of the women came to waters with the intent of maybe eventually crossing into the United States, but ultimately they find that they are able to make a life for themselves um, in proximity to the US um, where they have a certain mobility that perhaps if they do migrate to the United States, they might have, or crossing over to El Paso um, to be able to make more money in the type of work that they have to do. 
um, is satisfactory for them, right? So, you know, that, that, that idea that they are not accumulating like this, um, that these trans women are, I mean, I don't wanna think about their subjectivity as, as stuck in any kind of way, but I just think it functions in a different way that is constituted through that loss and that loss opens up various possibilities that, um, you know, thinking through the remains and kind of the dispossession that the raising and the tearing down of those buildings represents for everyone else in the city, but these trans women, right? So for everyone else, the working poor, like people who go, used to go to those clubs just to have a good time, or even used to go to those clubs to, you know, solicit these sex workers, you know, that loss represents something for them that is not as, that doesn't affect the sex workers in that same type of way, because they're still going to find ways to do the work that they do. Um, and their sociality will change and it will make them much more vulnerable. Um, but the, the loss is different in different types of, of ways. I'm not, I know I'm not fully answering your question, but I'm going to write it down and try to think through it some more. Um, but those are just kind of some preliminary thoughts on the, on the different types of loss that are not competing, but are dialectical in particular types of ways. Great, thank, thank you. you. So we do have a request and maybe we could just look at one of the sculpture images because I'm as curious maybe as some others are. Yeah, let me let me pull that up for it. Let me post a link for you for everyone to go to. That's a, a I think that's Kimberly who asked for that. Just I want to recognize those of you that are chatting. So that will take you to the kind of the gallery, the photos from that show, and, and you'll be able to see right on that first page, Mundos, and then also installed on the wall are um, pieces of a dance floor that Margolis excavated from a uh, building that was destroyed and, and arranged on a wall in a different orientation. It almost kind of looks like home decoration in some way, but I'm sure if we were able to interact with it, uh, it, we would see kind of the, the layers of life that was lived on that dance floor and rearranged. Like I think what I like about Margolis is that she, you know, really rearranges and, and plays with the matter in ways that challenge us um, in, in how we interact with the work as well. Um, Thanks. So hmm. we have a question from Anna and I'm just gonna read her talk. She says, fantastic talk, Frank, thank you. Neither Sansara nor Berenice look at the camera. I don't remember if the others do. Can you share your thoughts on the way they are posing, how they position their bodies in relation to the camera and on their relationship to Margolis in particular? I think you mentioned that Margolis worked with them, but I wonder about the relationship that was built between them. Uh, yeah, I think, um, so let me go, let me look at them myself as well for a minute. Um, so I think when I see why well, I pick Sansara is I think um, Sansara is so statuesque and I think in statuesque that plays in describing her as statuesque it plays on um, the way that someone who wanted to be problematic around talking about a trans body to ascribe a particular masculinity to them might describe them, but I mean statuesque in kind of a beautiful kind of feminine way um, in that, that makes me think of a kind of a monumental feminism and excess of feminism. And I think her gaze away from the camera um, really, um, really, you know, is, is wanting to, is looking, is looking elsewhere. I just think that she's uninterested in um, presumably maybe Margoyas, um, and, and the camera, but is really kind of committed to the pose. Um, I want to presume or imagine that she might have like a partner or a friend that she's looking at, because um, I do think in the looking away, it makes me want to think that she's looking for some form of sociality um, or some kind of future oriented gaze. Um, so to not deny us the opportunity to look at her straight in the eye, um, you know, gives us more than what she gets from this process in posing, I think, for Mar Margoya. So I think it, it's, a, it's an aversion to kind of the extractive nature that might happen like in these photographs. Um, and, I, and I think that by looking away, she doesn't have to, I think looking at us takes away from the seduction too. I think that that's also part of the femininity at play here too, by refusing to meet our gaze um, is what brings us into, bring, perks our curiosity more.
um, to to admire her and and and, and the pose that she's is is uh, is displaying in the in the piece. And then, you know, Berenice, um, I I find to be um, you know really kind of um, marked by what I understand to be kind of the trans pride flag kind of conjured in this way that is destructed, that is cut in half. Um, and to me that marks her place or or frames her, frames her place in the photo. And it looks like, you know, we might think of her as, as caught in a memory and, and, and kind of similarly to um, Sansara, not in the seduction, but rather in, you know, the refusal, the refusal to look in, and to meet our gaze and, and I think that also she seems a little bit more confined within a structure than the others. Um, she does have one wall behind her. Um, there might be one on the side we can't quite see. Um, so I do think that there's an element of confinement in this photo that there isn't in the others um, and, a, and a roughness and a harshness through like the wires that we see at the bottom. Um, and so I think that's what sets her apart from, from the others is that she denies us the gaze and there's also a, a, a bit of um, uh, confinement that she, I think I read her as, 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 as exceeding and persisting even within that confinement. Um, and this makes me think of, I didn't get to, to engage in this talk with Balaguera's work, but she, um, she's a scholar who spent lots of time talking with trans women in shelters. These are Central American trans women who are making their way from uh, various parts of Central America through Mexico to get to the US and finally, you know, be able to have their asylum hearings. And she describes, you know, how these women navigate confinement um, in different types of ways while they are, you know, wanting to um, move towards a mobility, right? So it's like a kind of mobile confinement that they experience. Um, and, I, and I see this kind of in the same way um, with Berenice because she looks, she doesn't look as stoic and as kind of, um, statuesque as Sansara. So like there, she looks poised for some kind of movement in some in some ways as well. Great. And so Melina sort of commented about the Venus, you know, echoing the Venus, which is sort of goes back mm -hmm. to the kind of monumental or iconic. And Melina also um, uh, comments, Sansara looks like a runway model. How might we understand the dance floor as a runway platform? Um, yeah, I think it's a. I think it's a definitely a platform. I think it's. <clears throat> I think it's about um, the the pleasure uh, the pleasure of the dance floor the um, and also the freedom that that working in nightclubs for this woman that it gave them as opposed to working doing sex work on the street. So from the narratives uh, that I've read from the nineteen nineties, um, a lot of these women mentioned that. Um, the working in the clubs gave them access to a kind of sociality with the other women that they worked with and as in a sense of protection. Um, and then, and so when I think of like a place like Irmas, which is where Sansara was posed, which is a kind of a historic site for these women um, where many of them uh, did business and, and had the sociality with each other that extended beyond the clubs because there are photos from the nineties that I've talked about in, in another talk where we see them in their everyday lives, and so um, I think that the that the the uh, the space kind of um, you know uh, is is that performance space. It's like it's performative, but not in the gender performance type of way, but rather like the the sociality, the performance of uh, the femininity, um, and whatever types of scenes that happen or have happened. Or whatever memory memories are evoked in these women being, you know, photographed in these areas. Great, thank you. And maybe one more, and this is from Eva. She says, "How are you thinking about the spatial distance of the camera in relation to these women?" Yes, they are included as part of the ruin, but I'm wondering if that distance is doing other kinds of work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you, Ava. And thank you for coming to Ava. Is, was my, my colleague at University of Arizona, and I have been so privileged to learn and, and think with her through her writing and and um, and our conversations too. And, and definitely, as I'm thinking of the distance, it makes me think of Jay Prosser's work, which is his essay on the Palinode, where he's, you know, he's talking about his former work in uh, in Second Skins. 
um, when he kind of realizes that he mistakenly conflates the real with the, the, the body and, and points to how in this photo that he discusses in um, Second Sex is this photo of um, a trans, man, trans man's, um, it's called, called the trans cock, right? Like it's literally a picture of genitalia, but it's really close up. And so the distant, the, the closeness of the camera is what, and the ruler that is there to measure the length is what makes it, you know, actually stand in as a cock or a penis. Um, so it's that distance, that closeness that reveals kind of the um, the trace uh, and the and and that and that it's not really a penis, right? Like it's so close. And the distance here, how the cow she's so far. I think that does a different type of work from like the work that Prosser is talking about and a work in a distance that this type of photo what Margolis is trying to do with the ruins, I think by being further out from them and not being so close, it creates um, a particular distance that I think um, differs from other photography on trans women where the photos are just so so close and so focused on revealing that trace of transsexuality that they aren't women. And I think that the distance really um, pushes up against that narrative of trans women not as women, but really kind of highlights the femininity in the poses, um, in the femininity in, the, in, in terms of the contrast of kind of the roughness of the space. Um, so I think the distance does more for the women than it does for the ruins, um, but it also really kind of interjects um, what trans does as kind of how these women have changed their bodies in relationship to the space and the, and the mattering and kind of the materiality um, that is enlivened um, in the ruins um, and how these women themselves are, are, are alive and enlivened. Um, so I'm, I'm gonna work through that idea and that question some more, but I do definitely think um, that the, the distance does, definitely does other kinds of work for sure. And I'd love to talk to you more Eva, about it when, when we get to see each other again in, in, in normal circumstances. Well, thank you so much, Francisco. And this is when I ask everybody to unmute yourself so that he can hear your applause and your thank yous out loud before we say goodbye. Okay, bye. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good job. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for being here. So thank you everyone for being here. And I just want to let you know that next month, that'll be Tuesday, April 6, 6 p.m., Zoom. Um, you can uh, uh, find the link on our website. It'll be Rhonda Brulat, The Art and Craft of Oaxacan Mezcal. And uh, here's just a couple of sentences. Not only is Mezcal Oaxaca Mexico's fastest growing rural industry, it connects the region to producers, brokers, and consumers across the U.S.-Mexico border and throughout the world. In this presentation, Dr. Rhonda Brulat discusses the rise of mezcal as a global commodity within the artisanal food movement, as well as how this transformation has impacted rural producer communities in Southern New Mexico. So that again is Tuesday, April 6th at six o'clock. I hope that you'll all join us. Francisco, thank you again. Thank you everyone. Thank you UNM. We love you at the NHCC and we hope to see you all next month. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Good night.